Happy International Day of Women and Girls in Science. My name is Chelsea. I do education and outreach at Snow Lab. Snow Lab is a deep underground research facility located inside the active Valley Crane nickel and copper mine just outside of Sudbury, Ontario. We study space from deep underground. The particles that we're looking for are very, very small and they're impossible to see. So I want you and your class to take a second to think about what is the smallest thing that you know of? Pause the video if you like. You might say a molecule, and molecules are in fact very, very tiny. Or even smaller than that, you might think of an atom. Or smaller than that, an electron. The things that we're looking for at Snow Lab are even smaller than that. We're looking for neutrinos, which are very, very small, weakly interacting particles that come from the sun and within the earth. Hundreds of trillions of neutrinos are passing through your body every single second without you even feeling it. They're so weakly interacting that they don't even interact with light. So that means even the most sensitive microscope couldn't detect a neutrino. We're also looking for dark matter, something that nobody has ever seen before. We're hoping to be the first. So to do these kinds of invisible science, we need to develop special kinds of tools like detectors that we use to detect them. So I want you to do another brainstorm. Pause the video after this and think about some things that you know exist, but that you can't actually see. So go ahead and pause, have a brainstorm, make a list on a piece of paper or with your class on the whiteboard. Some of the things that I can think of that are invisible, but I know they exist, are things like wind like temperature, like sound. We know that all of these things exist, but we need special kinds of tools to be able to measure them. For example, for wind, meteorologists use something called an anemometer. It's those little cups that spin on top of a weather station and a vane that uses the direction to determine which direction the wind is blowing in. For sound, we use different kinds of tools to be able to measure volume in decibels. But for dark matter and neutrinos, we need special kinds of tools that are located deep underground to be able to see them. The reason why our science is located underground is because on surface there's all kinds of particles called cosmic radiation that are coming from space. We don't feel them and we don't see them, but we know that they're there. One of the first types of particle detectors ever invented was called a cloud chamber, as you can see here. It uses supersaturated alcohol vapors, so alcohol in its gaseous form, in order to detect charged particles. This includes electrons, alphas, and betas, which are part of cosmic radiation that we experience on the Earth's surface. So by going two kilometers underground, underneath two kilometers of hard rock, we're able to filter out a factor of 50 million particles inside the lab. That way we can hear or see super, super small events inside the detector that tell us that one of these particles is passing through. These detectors use different kinds of mediums. So they use different materials that are the target material to observe these kinds of particles. Some of them are liquids, some of them are solids, and some of them are, ga are gases. All matter in the universe is made of solids, liquids, and gases. So let's dive into what that actually means. Let's imagine that you and your classmates are molecules, your water molecules. We'll start you off in a gaseous state. So if you were molecules of a gas, we would give you the space of say your entire gymnasium and you would have lots and lots of energy. So everyone's able to run around, they have lots of space, very high energy particles that fill up the volume of its container. And then if we convert you to a liquid, let's take away some of that energy, cooling you off and condensing you, moving from a gas to a liquid, and bring you into your classroom at a walking speed. Liquids take the shape of their container as well, and the molecules are freely able to pass between each other. So in your classroom, there's enough room for everyone to walk around each other without bumping into too many people. And finally, let's freeze you into a solid. When water forms a solid, it forms a crystal lattice structure around four degrees Celsius. It's one of the few materials that actually expands when it freezes. Typically, the particles in a solid are closer together than they would be in a liquid. But in the case of water, you and your classmates would join up arm to arm with your arms locked out straight to form nice rows and structures that would form a crystal of ice. If you like, you can do a hands-on experiment that demonstrates what solids, liquids, and gases look like using clear containers with small items inside. For mine, I use these clear plastic containers filled with beans. You could use rice or marbles, whatever kinds of small objects that you like. I have three containers here that represent 
gas, liquid, and solid. Take a look at them. This container has a few black beans in it, and this container represents gas. In a gas, the particles just take up the space of their container, they don't have an orderly type fashion, and they're really high energy. So if I shake this container, these particles are very excited, they have lots of energy, and they're moving around. Now if we look at our liquid, the beans inside represent the molecules, a liquid has slightly less energy. It flows and takes the shape of its container, but it doesn't have an organized shape. If I were to shake this container, the molecules in a liquid can pass freely around each other. And now, if I take my container of a solid, you can see all of those molecules are tightly packed. They don't have a lot of space to move. A solid has a defined shape, and the particles usually are connected to each other in an organized fashion. For example, when you freeze water, it forms a crystal lattice around 4 degrees Celsius, where the, the oxygen and hydrogen atoms arrange themselves in a specific fashion in rows to form crystals for ice. If I were to shake this solid, do you hear anything? That's because the molecules in the solid are firmly set in place, but they do actually vibrate just a little bit in their place. So what does this have to do with detecting dark matter or neutrinos? Well, we're going to play a game to help us understand how we look for invisible things using things that we can see. So if you were to have a detector that was filled with liquid, what would the molecules look like? Would they be tightly arranged in a small space? Would they be freely moving around? Or would they be very excited high energy particles moving all over? somewhere in the middle, right, where the molecules can move around. So we're going to use paper or plastic cups to represent the molecules of our target material, and we will use different types, and we will use different objects to act as our particle of interest. So we have to pretend that this ping pong ball, this tennis ball, and this ball of paper, as well as this tiny little bean, we have to pretend that these are invisible and we're going to act as scientists or detectives to figure out which direction the particle came from and what type of particle it was based on how much our cups move. So the cups are the things that we can see. That's our detector target material. If you're playing at school, grab a partner or work in a small group where one person is the scientist or the detective, and they're the ones who will have their backs turned or their eyes blindfolded while one of the particles is being thrown. Select a person in your classroom to be able to be the particle. So they might be throwing a tennis ball, a ball of paper, a ping pong ball, or even one of those tiny black beans that I used in the first example. It all depends on what kinds of cups you're using for your target material and what kinds of particles you'd like to use. If you're playing at home, you can blindfold yourself to make your throw, or you can recruit a sibling or somebody else who lives in your household to play the game with you or to be the detective. All right, so now we have our cups arranged in a solid fashion. So that means that they have a definite shape and volume and that there's probably a pattern in the arrangement of those molecules. So we have our cups set up side by side in orderly rows. So that represents a solid. If we were to throw one of these different types of particles, what would be some of the clues that we could use to determine what kind of particle it was? Remember, these are invisible and the scientists have to determine what kind of particle it was and what direction it came from. So which ones of our senses could we use if we can't see it? Well, we could use our sense of hearing. You might be able to hear a difference of sound with the different types of particles. We have an experiment that uses very sensitive microphones inside of it to measure the sound of a bubble formed when a particle enters. We can also use our sense of sight to have a look at the distribution of the cups. So what do the cups look like after the particle impact? Let's take a look at what that looks like for liquids. So you can see in a liquid, the cups are arranged a little bit differently. There's no pattern in terms of how close together the cups are. They're differently distributed. They take the shape of their container. So if we were to see a particle come in, it might be the ping pong ball. It might be a paper. It might be a ball we're going to see a different type of scattering or effect on a liquid compared to the solid. And the same thing for the gas. We can take a look at what that looks like here as well. 
In a gas, there's a lot of empty space between those particles, and so it'll be even harder to observe a collision. The particles are moving really quickly, and there's a lot of space in between them, so it might be even harder to detect what type of particle came through, how much energy it had, and which direction it came from. Once the particles have been thrown, make your best guess. That's what science is all about. We're making hypotheses and trying to find answers to our questions. To learn more about what different types of particles look like inside the detector, scientists at SnowLab do something called calibration. This is when they insert a source of a known type. So they're putting in a molecule or an atom or particle that we're familiar with and we're able to observe what that looks like in different parts of the detector. So we can tell what an event would look like in the top quadrant compared to the bottom, coming from different directions and of different particle types. Then, if we observe something that we've never seen before, it could be something like dark matter. We use different kinds of tools like these big experimental detectors to try and find out more about our universe. By understanding neutrinos and dark matter, the way they interact and different properties of them, we can begin to understand the origins of our universe right from the Big Bang and be able to predict where they might go in the future. Well, I hope you enjoyed that activity and that it revealed a little bit of the mystery that goes into detector science. Feel free to check out our virtual tour below. It'll be linked in the description of the video, as well as check out our website and follow us on social media at SnowLab Science. We'd be happy to take your questions on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. So send us a message.